Hi, welcome to Bridge Connection. We're in Psalm 55. David has been sharing his heart with God as he's going through some terrible, terrible things and uh, kind of relating them to when we go through hard things and how we're to respond. And we need to understand that we will always have to battle the temptation to flee from our problems instead of addressing them. And for many of us, the desire to escape uh, began clear back in childhood when we expressed the desire to run away from home. Uh, I'm not gonna go to school. Uh, as we grow older, make our, our own decisions, its influence is much more powerful to want to run. Consider the following examples. So many students drop out of school when things get tough. Spouses who choose to divorce to escape difficult marriages. Spouses or parents who grow weary of their responsibilities and just desert their families. There are people who jump from job to job when they get restless, just gonna, gonna stay there, gonna go here, gonna go here. Pastors, I've dealt with so many of them over the last 50 years, you know, who forsake God's call for an easier vocation. Members of churches who move from church to church when they become dissatisfied. We don't like what the pastor's saying. We don't like uh, whatever, the color, color of the carpet, whatever it is. As we're getting close and we don't like this, so go to another church. But most tragic of all, people who are so overwhelmed by their problems that they choose to end their lives. God has not called us to escape but God has called us to endure. When we lean on him in prayer and, and uh, saturate ourselves in his empowering word, and I can't tell us enough to saturate ourselves in the word, you know what'll happen? We will find the grace and strength to persevere throughout difficult situations. Warren Wiersbe said this, we don't need wings like a dove so we can fly away from the storm. We need wings like an eagle so we can fly above the storms. Galatians 6, 9 says, and let us not be weary in, in well-doing for in due season, due season we shall reap if we faint not. Well, David's mood changed and his righteous anger at his enemies erupted. In addition to their treachery against him, Absalom and uh, Ahithophel were wreaking havoc throughout Jerusalem. David prayed against their efforts and he called upon God to, to bring them to justice. David asked God to rain down confusion on his foes and to prevent their wicked plans from, from ever being accomplished. Look at verse nine. I guess we went through verse eight yesterday, okay? Verse nine, first part of it. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. So what's he saying? He's saying, I want them to be confused. I want them to be frustrated. So that it make no sense when they talk. You know, divide their tongues is a, is a reference to the action God took to thwart the prideful efforts of the builders trying to construct the tower of, of uh, Babel. Remember in Genesis chapter 11? David prayed that God would take a a similar action to keep his enemies from succeeding, succeeding. Let them talk and not be understood. Let them not even know what they're saying. Just let, let them just babble on. If God did not intervene to stop Absalom and Ahithophel, they would destroy the nation. They constantly, it was just kind of their, their thing to, to stir up violence and strife prowling about all over Jerusalem day and night in their evil efforts to destroy David. Back to verse nine, destroy O Lord and divide their tongues for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, iniquity and trouble also in the midst of it. Verse 11, Destruction is in the midst. 
oppression and deceit do not depart from its streets. So violence describes their actions as, as evil, sinful, uh, worthless. It also refers to causing trouble and, and creating hardships for, for others. These men were a destructive force in the city, using lies and threats and everything they could to coerce the people into supporting them and coming against God's anointed, David. And as David expressed his indignation to God, his deep grief over his friend's betrayal surfaced. David unleashed the, his, the hurt in his heart conveying how much easier it would be, would have been so much easier to stand against an enemy's insults and oppression than a close friend's betrayal. And I think we've all been there. When a close friend betrays, it hurts. And you're not, you're not expecting it. Verse 12, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, that I could hide from him, but it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance, being betrayed by his trusted advisor and praying for God to judge him was more than David could bear. He poured out his pain to the Lord as, as if he were speaking directly to Ahithophel, addressing his, his betrayer, did you know this said? As his equal, his guide, his, his acquaintance. So how this must have, must have hurt David. Verse 13, but it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. I just keep reading that because it, it just blows my mind. The Hebrew word for guide there indicates that they were the closest of companions, the best of friends. Acquaintance stresses how personally they had come to, to know each other through the experiences that they had shared together. Having sought God's will together, David and Ahithophel had also developed a, a spiritual bond and they had, had enjoyed sweet fellowship as they joined their spirits in worshiping God with the congregation of, of Israel. How it must have pained him. We've probably all been there, experienced similar things, and, and oh, how it hurts. Verse 14, we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. Verse 15, let death seize them. Let them go down alive into hell for wickedness is in their dwelling and among them. Uh, he must have been so pained to pray a prayer like this. David's responsibility as a king prevailed over his aching heart for both his son and his trusted friend. See, fulfilling his duty to his nation, he called upon God to swiftly execute justice on those who had made themselves his and Israel's enemies by revolting against God's anointed king. He prayed for death to seize them. He prayed for death to come suddenly and unexpectedly upon them. By praying for them to go down quick or alive into hell or the grave, David requested that they would immediately go to the place of the dead, as opposed to living out all of their natural days or living to an old age somewhere. This statement is a, a reference to God's judgment on, on Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who rose up against Moses in the wilderness over number 16 when we were there. You, you would remember it. Like Moses' opponents, David's foes deserved to, to die prematurely for allowing evil to dwell within them. Just think about this for a second. Because we are made in God's image, we become angry over the deeds of, of uh, evildoers 
and we desire to see them brought to justice. However, we must be careful not to allow our anger to cause us to sin. Furthermore, we should never take justice into our own hands, nor should we seek vengeance on those who do evil against us. When a crime has been committed, we are to turn to civil authorities for justice as God has developed this responsibility to them. He's delegated it to them, I'm sorry. Ultimately, we, we have to trust the Lord to, to do right in all things. And we need to wait patiently for him to act in, in good time. You know, we need to remember that Christ has commanded us to live by a higher law. It was a higher law, a higher standard than, than in, during David's time. Um, we are to love our enemies that have been, not been taught before. We are to pray for our enemies. That was the first time they ever heard it when Jesus said that. And we are to good, do good to them. Our Heavenly Father, and He will, and, and, and what we'll be doing at that time is we'll be imitating our Heavenly Father. And He will richly reward us as we walk in obedience. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them who curse you, do good to them who hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Romans 2, 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Romans 12, 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So we need to grasp that and let God take care of things. That's why I said we need to saturate ourselves, ourselves in the word and in prayer. Instead of continuing to fret and to fear what his enemies might do to him, David declared that he would, he would call upon God. As he prayed, God assured him that he would protect him from these evildoers. David expressed his confidence in God that he would save him and sustain him and that he would deal justly with his foes. Look at verse 16. This is his commitment. After all the anger, everything, this is what he says. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. David firmly believed that God would deliver him from his enemies. His heart was so burdened that he called upon God in the evening, in the morning, and at noon, all throughout the day. Look at verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He prayed with the confidence that God heard his cries of distress, and he prayed with confidence that God would answer his prayers. He shall hear my voice. That word hear means more than just listening with the ear. It, it means to hearken, to heed, uh, to act in response to what has been said. As David prayed, you listen to verse 18 in a second. He gained assurance that God was at work in his situation. Listen to this. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me for there were many against me. And, and just kind of as a result of this unexplainable peace of God swept over his soul, reminds me of Philippians 4, 6, and 7, that will allow the peace of God to rule and reign in your hearts. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. Let the peace rule. In fact, he used a Hebrew perfect verb to express his deliverance from his enemies as if it had already been done. Confidence that God rules forever and is the great judge. He will humble those who oppose you. And now David, continuing to speak in faith, he declared that God rules eternally as the great judge of the earth and he will always do what is right. Listen to it in verse 19. God will hear and afflict them. Even he who abides from old, 
Selah. Just that first part of that verse, you're going to stop and think about it for a minute. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. God would hear the lies, the devious plans of David's enemies, and he would justly respond by afflicting or humiliating them. They would, beyond all question, suffer God's judgment, all because they refused to repent and they continued to reject God. Once again, once again, David emphasized the treachery of his trusted friend, Ahithophel. That, that, that must have hurt him so deeply because he keeps coming back to this. This man had betrayed David without cause, callously breaking his promise or covenant of friendship and loyalty with David. Listen to how David puts it in verse 20. He has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. So David is now recalling the, the things that his two-faced companion had, had said to him. His smooth, soft words were flattering and reassuring, but they were deceptive. They masked his evil heart, a heart that was full of strife and division, set on making war against God's anointed king. <laughs> If you cast your burden on God, you can have the same confidence that God will sustain you. David concluded with a, with a word of counsel to all who would read this song. When you are in deep stress, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. First part of 22 says, cast your burden on the Lord and what? he shall sustain you. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Don't carry that any longer, my friend. Give it to Jesus. David had learned this valuable lesson through his experience. When he began his prayer, he was carrying the full weight of his trouble on his own shoulders. When he gave it to God, God granted him glorious peace, tremendous confidence, whereas David had previously feared for his life, Rebecca verses four and five. He was now sure that God would never let him fall and that God would execute justice against the wicked. In, in, in faith, David declared that his bloodthirsty lying enemies would go to an early grave. Listen to this, last part of verse 22 and then verse 23, listen how David puts it. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Did you hear that? You're the righteous, my friend. <laughs> he shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Verse 23, but you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. David's trust in God was so well placed and his enemies tragically reaped the corruption they had sown. And as scripture records, God prevented Ahithophel's evil plans from succeeding. And eventually, this disgraced advisor who had hurt David so deeply and had turned his back on God, he eventually took his own life. Second Samuel, Second Samuel 17. God's justice also came upon the king's rebellious son. As Absalom rode in battle against David's men, he was caught and slain when his heavy and flowing hair became entangled in the branches of an oak tree. Second Samuel 18, he suffered a bizarre and gruesome death. If we are wise, I know some of you are going through some stuff, so listen to me, please. If we are wise, we will heed David's advice to cast our burdens on the Lord. Interesting, the Hebrew word for cast here is also used of breaking the chains or ropes that hold a person captive. When we choose to bear our own burdens, they become chains that 
keep us in, in bondage to fear, dread, and worry. But when we give our burdens to the Lord, we are set free to live in the realm of peace and faith. God doesn't want you. God doesn't want me to carry the unbearable load of our afflictions. Again and again and again in Scripture, he invites us to throw them off and, 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 and allow him to bear them for us. But we have to trust God enough to commit our trouble to him. When we fully trust God with our problems, our fears and anxieties will wondrously vanish. And the precious peace of God, the precious peace of God, I love the peace of God that passes all understanding, will reign in their place. Like David, we will be filled with confidence in God and will experience his sustaining and victorious power. Listen to these words in closing of 2 Corinthians 4, verses 13 and 14. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. All we have to do is trust Believe him. That thing you're going through right now could be really heavy, really hard, really painful. But I'm telling you, cast it to Jesus. The Bible says cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. There's two different words there for care. Cast all your cares on him. Those things that have you burdened, that have you, you know, so, so wrapped up right now. Cast those on him because the second word for care is there. It has to do with he has a plan. Cast all your cares on him because he cares about you so much. He has a plan. He, he knows exactly what he's going to do. And he can't do it until you just give it away and cast it, cast it on him. Please do that. Father, as we close in prayer this, this day, I ask that you would touch each and every one listening today or watching today, Lord, that each one of us would choose to go David's route, Lord. We've been angry. <laughs> we don't want to do that anymore, Lord. We want to come to that place where we trust you because we know that you're going to take care of everything. Give us a fresh hunger for your word that we've never had before. Jesus, thank you. It's in your incredible name that we pray, Lord. Amen. See you tomorrow. Pre-read ahead of time, Psalm 60. Psalm, excuse me, I want to get out of Psalms, right? And skip 10, Psalm 56. Okay, God bless you.